Hello, I'm Death Zero, and welcome to Episode 9 of What I'm Thinking. In the previous episode, I explored the new Encounter game mode. In this episode, I will take a look at the other new game mode, called Assault. The M26 Pershing will be the featured tank for the replays in this episode. The Assault game mode has only one base that's randomly assigned to one of the teams who become the defenders. The other team, who becomes the attackers, have no base at all and are to capture the enemy base or destroy all enemies. Battle time is reduced to 10 minutes in this mode. If the attacking team fails to complete their goal in the allotted time or are all destroyed, the defenders win. Base capture rate, unlike in counter mode, is just like standard mode. The maps which currently allow assault battles are Erlenberg, Karelia, Malinovka, Porkhorovka, and San River. It should be noted that assault battles are randomly assigned with a 20% frequency of occurrence. Much like the encounter battle mode, the spawns and base locations for each map are different from the standard battle mode, which changes the way the maps play and requires new tactics. What makes this mode particularly challenging at times is that it requires a high level of team coordination for success, especially for the attacking team, something that's not easy to do in random matches. Unlike in counter battles, assault battles are not balanced. In all cases, one of the teams has a definitive advantage. Erlenberg and San River favor the attackers, while Karelia, Malnovka, and Porch Horikova favor the defenders. Maps that favor the defenders have good hard cover near the base or high points overlooking the base, while the maps that favor the attackers are maps without good defensive hard points or have multiple open routes of attack. As mentioned in the episode introduction, the M26 Pershing is a featured tank for this episode. The introduction for this American medium tank is as follows. From a historical perspective, the M26 Pershing was an American tank classified as heavy and later a medium tank developed in 1943 and 44, which served briefly in both World War II and the Korean War. The tank is named after General John J. Pershing, who led the American Expeditionary Force in Europe in World War I. The development of the Pershing was the culmination of a series of tank prototypes, which began with the T-20, T-22, and T-23 projects in mid-1942 as a successor to the M4 Sherman. Through 1943, there was little perceived need for a better tank than the 75mm Sherman, but the Ordnance Department pushed forward of their own accord and without any insight from the Army as to what was needed and began production of the T-23 in mid-1943. 250 T-23s were built by the end of 1943, but the tank was ultimately rejected due to it requiring the Army to adopt an entirely separate line of training, repair, and maintenance. The next line of tank development was the T-25 and T-26, which caused heated debates within the U.S. Army over the need for tanks with greater firepower and armor. Both tank prototypes mounted a 90mm gun in a new turret design. The T-26 was also given additional front hull armor. This increased the tank's weight to 36 tons and significantly decreased its mobility. There is considerable historical debate over why the Pershing's production and deployment in World War II was delayed. It has been thought that the Pershing could have been developed and ready for deployment by the time of the Normandy invasion in mid-1944, rather than only 20 Pershings reaching the battlefield in January of 1945. The leading and generally accepted theory is that the delay of the Pershing was due to opposition to the tank from the Army ground forces who believed that the 75mm M4 Sherman was more than adequate to handle the majority of German armor, and, per Army ground forces head General Leslie M. McNair, that there was no basis for the Pershing other than the conception of a tank vs. tank duel which is believed to be unsound and unnecessary. Furthermore, the Army ground forces underestimated both the Panther and the Tiger as they were only seen in limited numbers and not considered a major threat. In stark contrast, the Soviets were in a full-blown tanks arm race, responding to the Tiger and Panther by developing the T-3485 and the IS. Twenty Pershings were deployed to the European theater in January of 1945 and were committed to combat on February 25th. Pershings were quickly proven to be effective against Tiger and Panther tanks in a limited number of engagements prior to the end of the war. Twelve Pershings were sent to the Pacific theater, but were unable to reach Okinawa for deployment prior to the end of the fighting there. The Pershing was fielded in the Korean War until 1951 when they were withdrawn due to a marked decrease in tank-to-tank -tank action along with the poor performance of the tank in the mountainous Korean terrain. Many of these tanks were reassigned to occupation duty in Germany. The Pershing ultimately became the base of the Patton series of tanks, which are still in service in many countries today. 
In World of Tanks, the M26 Pershing is quite similar to its predecessor, the T-20, but with better armor and armament. While the Pershing isn't quite as mobile as the T-20, it does have a significant advantage in hull-down situations due to its heavily armored gun mantlet, making the Pershing a very effective mid-range sniper. While the mobility of the Pershing isn't quite as good as the T-20, it's still nimble enough to circle slow heavies and put a hurting on them. My general strategy with the Pershing is to play positional warfare. I attempt to take key positions on the map to deny those areas to the enemy to harass and stall their advance. If the position can't be held, I fall back. If the enemy hasn't properly covered the area, I push on them and move to the next forward position. This strategy works better when you have support and is very effective in platoons. For equipment on this tank, I recommend vents to improve all crew skills, a rammer to decrease reload time, and a vertical stabilizer to improve aiming on the move. For crew skills, I recommend repair, although camo is a useful skill as well. For additional skills, I recommend mentor, recon, snapshot, smooth ride, situational awareness, adrenaline rush, and brothers in arms. The first replay that we'll be looking at is a solo assault battle on Corellia from June 24th, 2012. The map for this battle is Corellia. I did an intro of the standard battle mode for this map in episode 3 of the series. In assault mode, the base is located in C3 on the northwestern side of the map with defenders spawning at the base. The attacker's spawn is at I8 and H9 at the southeast corner. There's ample cover for the defenders around the cap. The routes of attack are somewhat limited with the attacking team pushing up the hills on the northwest and southeast corners. Snipers can be very effective on top of the hill at G7, provided they get spots from their teammates. One effective defensive scouting technique that I've seen used is to place a spotter at the base of the hill at G7, which provides proxy spotting for any enemies located near the cliff edge. The first thing that should be noted from the loading screen is the battle type, which is assault. The line below that states mission, keep the friendly base secure or destroy all enemy vehicles which denotes that my team is on defense. Reviewing tank composition for this battle reveals the following. This is a tier 8 battle with three tier 8s per side. My team has more tier 7s, which is likely compensation for the enemy's team having a tier 8 heavy, while we don't have any. The enemy's team has more tier 6s and a tier 4 scout. Both teams have a tier 4 arty. Arty isn't all that useful for defense in my experience. I don't recognize anyone in this battle. As noted in the introduction, this is a defense. Based on what I've seen on this map so far, the enemy will push hard in one direction, leaving the other flank open. My plan here is to rush off to the southern flank, take a position near the rocks, and attempt to spot the enemy. I get underway, planning to head through the middle and then down south. This will give me a chance to spot any tanks that quickly try to get to the top of the ridge across from our base. Although, I don't really see that many tanks going that way, as the enemy doesn't have any TDs. The ground here is soft and is slowing me down slightly, although not that much. Pershing can be a bit sluggish at times, but it's fast enough to get to key positions when necessary. I'm going to use these rocks that are in front of me here for cover, then poke out a bit and spot the enemy. I am up at a forward position here. M5, Type 59 spotted. Take a snapshot at the M5 and miss. I'm not going to get a shot on that 59. He's in the ditch there. Bounce a shot from the M5. It's another shot from the M5. I'm in a good position here. The enemy hasn't sent any heavies this way yet. And I'm spotting them for our support back near our base. Here's the M5. Looks like a 3001H has snuck through as well. Take a shot on the M5 and hit him. Bounce his return shot. M5 takes another shot. I'm way behind that rock though. He might be able to see part of my track. Bounce a shot. Missed my return shot there. Misses his shot. Duel going here. Enemy armor is destroyed. I knock him down. 
have a shot on that 3001H as he climbs the hill. Punch right through their armor. A nice flank shot there. He disappears. I bounce his return shot. Type 59 charging in. Back up behind the rock to force him to come around, which will allow me to have some support here. He hits me in the front for some damage. Very minor. We're now face-hugging, essentially. This is an advantage to me. Type 59 does have some hard armor, but the commander's cupola is very weak and can be punched through over and over. He's not making it particularly difficult on me. I'm also taking flank fire from a T1 Heavy. And he's damaged my ammunition rack, which I will definitely repair. Still taking fire from the flank there. And our T1 Heavy knocks down their 59. Keep going. I'm 55% health here, and I'm going to face up this T1 Heavy. We nailed it back. Punch him in the face. I'm going to move up on him. He's damaged my gas tanks. It's not really a big hassle. Hit him again. Panther's up on the hill taking care of the 3001. This could have gotten ugly if I had to take them both on in this position. Knock down the T1 heavy. With this flank lightly defended, I'm now going to push up. The enemy is pushing the northern flank pretty hard based on what I'm seeing on the mini-map. We've got one medium left at A9. The enemy, I saw at least four tanks last time I looked at the mini-map. We've got good coverage in base based on what I'm seeing here. Artie knocks down our Artie. Not really a big loss. That Panther there, based on what I saw in match, was AFK. It's kind of an odd position for him to sit in. That Artie is on my left. T20 hits me, knocks down my track. Turn fire and damage him. I'd like to knock down that Artie. Artie pops me for 6% damage. Not, nothing too major. Get another hit in on the T20. I'm now trying to back up and trying to uh, take the T20 out of this equation right now. Between him and the Artie, they could do some pretty good damage before I can knock one of them down. I'm going to push on the Artie here. Got support, too, behind me. I believe it's a Panther, potentially a T1. I'm not sure. This angle really doesn't show me what's going on. Tiger on top of the hill. He'd actually hit me in the flank in that scrum with the T59. Hit the arty there. Basically using... This is essentially a hold-down position for me. We nailed back. And uh, I hit the tiger in the turret. Arty tries to charge me. Hits me again, but I hit him and knock him down. Now I'm going to push up on this tiger. I am at 30% health. I do have a significant advantage here. With the way the terrain is sloped here, I can shoot that tiger in ways that the tiger can't shoot back and depress his gun enough as the tiger does not have good gun depression. I'm not sure why this tiger is actually ignoring me here. He's pushing down the hill. He actually aims on me here. Turn his turret back. I'm not sure what he's doing. Bump him there. Panther knocks him down. corner and down the hill, attempting to help the IS with the T-20, but he knocks him down first. The enemy is pushing very hard on our base now. Since we've cleared the southern flank and the rear guard, we're going to circle around and attack the last batch of enemies from behind. Forcing the enemy to fight from two directions is a definitive advantage for us. My plan here is to climb up on top of the hill, not all the way, just the first level, and use the height to improve my ability to get good shots on them. I'm 
enemy, they're going to expect that these guys will turn to face both threats, which means they'll be crushed, or they'll blindly push on and allow me to get numerous flank shots on them as they ignore us from the rear. Two shots taken, both misses. Continuing to push up here. I'm feeling a little bit of pressure here to help our defenders. Finally get a hit on the Pershing, knocking him down to one shotable status. Missed my second shot on him. Continuing to push up. It's important here to keep putting the pressure on the rear of the enemy as they could overwhelm our base defenses. Pushing hard here. If you look at what's left at our base, it's a T1 Heavy, a Tiger, a T43, and a Panzer IV. If we hadn't circled around and pushed with the definitiveness that we did, this could have been a loss pretty easily. Back of that T-150. Line him up again. Knock him down. Actually, no, the IS took the kill. Panther knocks down the KV-1. Enemy's kind of silly to try to cap here. Puts them in a position where there's no cover. And they're basically surrounded. IS knocks down the M-26. Pushing in on this KV-2. back for the win. Looking at the victory screen, I killed 4 tanks, damaged 6, detected 8, hit 23 of 32 shots, and earned 2,098 experience before the double. I also earned a steel wall and confederate medal. Overall, while I did get lucky going to the lightly defended flank, I made the most of the opportunity, defeating the enemies on that side, allowing me to push into the enemy's rear guard, and ultimately allowing me to circle behind the main enemy attack as they push towards our cap. While the Pershing isn't the best brawler, I was forced into close quarters combat with that Type 59. The Type 59 does have good frontal armor, but the Commander's Copula is a weak spot that I took advantage of. Knowing tank weak spots is important to learn and will help you significantly. The second replay that we'll be looking at is a platoon assault battle on Sand River from July 3rd, 2012. I am platoon with Jovial Madness in his Type 59 and Gamer321 in his T25AT. The map for this battle is Sand River. This map is an open desert map with rolling terrain. Three small villages are spread over the center of the map surrounding the river. In assault mode, the base is located at C6 and 7. The defending team spawns at the base. The attacking team spawns on the hill located at H1 and I1. There are four routes of attack, which are fairly open and difficult to defend. Cover at the cap is very sparse. The defender's biggest advantage is the cliff in the middle of the map, which provides good line of sight on the attackers. As noted on the loading screen, this is an assault battle. Mission, capture the enemy base or destroy all enemy vehicles, which denotes that my team is attacking. Reviewing tank composition for this battle reveals the following. This is a tier 8 battle with three tier 8s per side. My team has two additional tier 7s, likely to compensate for the enemy having a tier 8 heavy while we have none. The enemy has more tier 6s. My team has a tier 5 scout. There is no arty, and I don't recognize anyone in this match. As noted in the intro, this is an attack. We have a brief platoon discussion here early on to decide what we want to do. We decide we're going to push hard from the east as a group. One thing you really can't see very clearly here because it's covered is the chat, and Gamer is actually passing along our platoon instructions to the team in order to get them to all go the same way as us. Let's go. Oddly enough, Gamer actually goes north instead of south, which his plan is to defend that opposite flank to keep the enemy from pushing in on our behind. As we move out here, it looks like most of the team is actually going to follow along with our plan, which is kind of surprising. A lot of times, pubs don't really want to listen to what you want to do, and want to do their own thing, rather than actually do a plan of any sort. 
Enemy has a Pershing crossing the middle bridge. Gamer gets some shots in on him. Gamer is alone there at the moment, which is a little dangerous. He is a tier 7 tank destroyer versus a tier 8. But he's holding his own so far. Continuing to push in mass to the east. Gamer has a little help there, and they're holding that Pershing in bay. And that's critical. Don't want the enemy pushing on your rear flank while you're trying to attack. We don't have any Artie to defend. That's something I hadn't mentioned as of yet. Looks like the enemy's got a pretty good defensive mass around the hill here. I'm going to slow up and start taking some snipe shots at their guys on the hill. We nailed it back. Get a hit on my first shot. Penetration. Another hit. The enemy's going to sit up there exposed. I'm going to take shots all day long. Although I can't sit here stalled in a snipe position for too long because we need to keep pushing. With no enemies in sight, I push up further. Arrow sticks his head back up. It's not quite exposed enough to shoot at. But that S100 is, and I hit him in the side. Get some supporting fire, and he's knocked down. I keep pushing up here get to this key spot here, which in standard battles is a great defensive position for this base. In this case, it's going to be an excellent sniping position to attack from. T-50-2 is pushed all the way up to their cab. Jovial is putting fire there on the opposite side of the hill. I really don't have any shots, so I'm going to come around. Not gonna stop and keep pushing. Jovial gets tracked. On the opposite flank, Gamer got knocked down. What he does here for the rest of the battle, which is gonna be impossible to see, is that he continues to spur the team on here through the chat, telling them to push, telling them to stop sniping, telling them to keep moving. And that's critical. The enemy has four tanks on the opposite flank. If we allow them too much time, they'll be able to get back and defend Cap as we continue to push forward. I'm continuing to push here. Continue to knock down their defenders. T-44 here, and I'm pushing in on him. Anything I can do to keep pushing, as long as my health is good, is going to help the team to keep moving forward. down the T-44 and keep moving forward. The other flank is completely folded here, based on what I'm seeing on the mini-map, but we're still moving in mass towards the cap. That tank behind us is actually behind the hill. It's a T-3485. Tiger's defending cap here. He's really not in a good position. He can get shots on the attackers, but he's really out in the open. Enemy armor is damaged. And he keeps showing the side of his turret to me, so I keep taking shots on him. We're capping in mass now. Enemy's T-20 has made it back. T-34 is climbing the hill. KV-1 is climbing the hill towards us. Poke out. Knock down the T-20. And we're in good shape here as we cap out the base for the win. Looking at the victory screen, I destroyed two tanks, damaged three, hit 11 of 14 shots, and earned 1,107 experience. Overall, the key to this battle was the majority of the team following along with our platoon's plan of attacking in mass from the east side of the map. Attacking in mass in one direction is particularly effective when there is no arty to protect. Gamer's communication with the team was also critically important as he conveyed our plan to the team as well as spurring them on to keep pushing towards the enemy's base. An overwhelming attack like this can easily stall in pub matches, which would have allowed the defenders on the other flank a chance to come back and stop our cap. Thank you for watching this episode of What I'm Thinking. Stay tuned for another episode soon. In the next episode, I will take a look at the lower half of the new French tank destroyer line. Ha, ha, ha.